This call stretches from Genesis chapter 25 through 50. Uh, Jacob's birth, like his father's, was a divine work. Uh, his mother was unable to have children. You might have a look at Genesis 25, verse 21, where it speaks about how they were trying to have kids for about 20 years and they weren't able to. Jacob was a twin. He was the younger by mere minutes. His brother was a man named Esau. And uh, I always get a chuckle when you look at meaning of names because often they would name their children based on circumstance. And so when Esau came out, he was really hairy. Uh, and so guess what his name was? Harry. <laughs> That's what Esau means. <laughs> it means hairy one. And so he was uh, unusually blessed with uh, hair. Uh, his brother, though, came out smooth skinned, but he had a distinguishing thing about him. He came out holding on to his brother's heel. And so Esau came out first, but little baby Jacob, uh, who had been fighting with his brother in the womb, in fact, his mother was so troubled by the ruckus going on in the side that she had actually gone and prayed to God about it. And God, by a special word to her, said there's actually two nations in your womb and they're gonna be at odds with each other. And so all the poking and whatever or not they were doing in the womb carried on through the rest of their lives and through the generations that followed afterward. And so he got the name Jacob, which means he who grasps. That's what Jacob meant. It also figuratively meant deceiver. And so there's that double side to it. And he lived up to that name, unfortunately, too, all too well. Uh, before becoming a follower of God, he was not a good guy. In fact, he, you would say he was kind of a low-down, low conniving, backstabbing, rip-off artist before he became a follower of God. Uh, for example, one day his brother, who liked to hunt, David, uh, Jacob was a stay-at-home guy, stayed at home with mom, and then you got the whole issue of family dynamics. Uh, uh, Jacob's mom favored him. Esau, his dad favored him, and so that's not good when it comes to kids. Uh, Jacob was a man of the open, uh, Esau was a man of the open field, and Jacob stayed at home, and so one day Esau comes back, he's hungry, he hadn't caught anything. In his mind, he was on the verge of starving to death, and so he asked Jacob for some food. Jacob, living up to his name, uh, says, well, you, uh, you sell me your birthright, and you can have some food. Now the birthright was kind of a big deal because it actually meant that you got a double portion of the family estate. So it's not just like, oh, you get like a name plaque or something like that. No, you get double whatever any other kid in the family gets when it comes time to mom and dad passing on their inheritance. Not only that, you became the head of the family. You were the spiritual leader of the family. And so this is the deal. Jacob says to him, you sell me your birthright and I'll give you uh, some food. And in one of the brainiest moves ever, uh, Esau agrees to it. Not brainy at all, worst deal ever. Um, so it's bad on him. Esau is, uh, is uh, chided for, by God for despising his birthright, for treating it as meaning, meaningless. And then you've got Jacob who is cheating his brother. Why don't you just give him a bowl of food? Uh, and so you've got both of them failing at that particular point. Another example of Jacob not being a good guy before becoming a follower of God is in Genesis 27. Uh, Isaac, uh, his father, thinks he's going to die. He has lost his vision, lost some of his vigor in life, and doesn't know how many years he has left. Because he's really, he's, a, he's, a, he's an older person. He's up in his 90s, maybe a bit older. He actually lived quite a bit longer after that. If you look later on in the text, it says he lived to be 180. People lived longer in those days. They don't have all the genetic, they didn't have as many genetic problems as you and I have today. And so, but he thinks he's dying. And so he wants to pass on a blessing to his son Esau. Well, the mom hears about it. She was a bit of a weasel too, actually. Uh, she hears about it and says, you know what? We're gonna trick the old man into giving you the blessing. And he's like, well, I'm kind of smooth skinned and I don't smell like him and all this stuff. She says, don't worry, we've got some animal skins and we'll get you dressed up right. And by the way, if you're found out, whatever curse that comes out of it, well, I'm going to take it. So mother and son decide that they're going to trick dad and they do. And then Esau gets home and he's found something for his father. And there's kind of a freak out moment that happens in the passage. And it's discovered that Jacob has yet again ripped off his brother. And then mom hears this news that, you know, brother is not very happy at all. In fact, brother Esau is uh, 
waiting for the day that dad dies so he can kill Jacob. And so his mom dreams up, she's actually pretty good at dreaming up things, uh, she dreams up a plan that Jacob can kind of leave town subtly. She's not happy with his, his uh, she, he was a single man. In fact, he, these two brothers probably were in their 60s and 70s. They're not 20 year olds. Uh, they're, they're, up, they're, they're getting up there. Uh, and and uh, Jacob is single and uh, Esau is not. Esau had married two of the Hittite women and that was not very, did not please mom and dad very much from taking a woman from that culture that was in, embedded in all the idolatry that went with it. And so she says, you know what, if, if my son marries one of the local women, uh, my life isn't gonna be worth living anymore. And so this is the pl plan to get son out of town so when, when father dies, that, that her favorite son doesn't get killed. And so that's sort of the backdrop. That's the kind of person that Jacob was. <laughs> That's the backdrop to this incredible call of God, which you and I are going to look at in Genesis 28 together. But let's start up in verse 41 of chapter 27, and then we'll, we'll read from there through chapter 28. And I got a, uh, four or five points I just want to share with you about Jacob's call. And then this morning we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Now Esau, in chapter 27, verse 41, Esau held a grudge, and we all know that, we, well, we don't all know. Actually, if I was in English class, I would get in trouble for using we all know. <laughs> Let me just tell you, holding a grudge is not a good thing. It's not good for you. It's not good for your relationship with other people. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And so he said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near, and then I'm going to kill my brother Jacob. Now when Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said, she went for her younger son Jacob and she said to him, you know, your brother Esau is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, not like that's going to happen, uh, I will send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? And then to sort of cement this, Rebecca then said to Isaac, you know, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from the Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. And so Isaac called for Jacob and blessed him and commanded him, do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Paddan Aram, to the house of your mother's father Bethuel, Take a wife for yourself from there, from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. And may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham, so that you may take possession of the land where you now live as an alien, the land that God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way, and he went to Paddan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob and Esau. Now Esau learned that Isaac had blessed Jacob and had sent him to Pat and Aaron to take a wife from there and that he'd blessed them with this commandment, don't marry a Canaanite woman, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and had gone to Pat and Aaron. And so Esau then realized how displeasing the Canaanite women were to his father Isaac. And so guess what? He went to Ishmael and married Mahalath, the sister of Nebaioth, and the daughter of Ishmael, son of Abraham, in addition to the wives that he already had. And so, making a bad situation worse. And, and, and we know it's, it's a, his effort to kind of win favor with his parents, but the fact is, is Ishmael wasn't of the line and seed of promise. Uh, and so he just compounds the problem by, by this, but he's, he's really trying to please his parents, but it's not, not the right way. Now Jacob left Be Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. And he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you're lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you 
and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't aware of it. And he was afraid. And he said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And so early the next morning, Jacob took the stone that he had placed under his head, and he set it up as a pillar, and he poured oil on top of it, and he called that place Bethel, which means the house of God, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey that I'm taking, I will, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. And so that's the account of Jacob and his call. And there's a number of points that I just want to share with you this morning. First off, and some of them are short, some of them are a little bit longer. Uh, we've got the background to him, but it, where does his call come? It comes at a moment of crisis in his life. It, it, you know, here we are, he's come from a wealthy family. He's been living at home. And where is he right now? He's running away, his life is in danger. Everything that he has touched is turned to dust. He, he, it's because of what, why is it? It's because of him. It's because of his character. And he has none at this particular point. He's not a good person. Uh, he, everything he does is for himself. And so his life is falling apart. And so all of these are self-inflicted wounds in his life. And so there's this crisis point in his life. He leaves home empty-handed. And, it, and, and you know, on one hand, you might look at it and say, well, where is my sympathy for someone that's such a you know, conniving person? And yet, this is at the point when God calls them. And, it, and, you know, some people, when they come to the Lord, not for everyone, but some people, it's when they hit rock bottom in their life, and, and then they finally lift their eyes up to God, and they give their heart to Christ, and God gets their attention. And some people, it's that way. And other people, it's not that way. You know, the Holy Spirit, and it's always the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit talks to people's hearts, convicts them of their sin, leads them to Christ. They respond in faith. But, but there are some people that it takes hitting rock bottom before uh, they, they, they turn their eyes to Christ and to God. The second point that I have is, is as it's, it is the case for all people, Jacob didn't deserve or merit the grace and favor of God. No one does. What does the Bible say about us? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible verse that we've been learning the last few months, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. God's the one that takes the initiative in bringing us to himself. It's not because we're good people that's going to be doing God a favor. No, it's the grace of God lavished upon us and it's in and through the person of Christ and the work of the cross. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9 tells us exa exactly of this when it says, it is by grace that you've been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And so at the point of his call, at the point of crisis, but it's also something just totally undeserved. And the same remains true today when God calls a person into relationship with himself. It's not because we're better or good or somehow meriting God's favor. It's, a, it's the, an act of God's mercy and grace and love that we may be trophies of his mercy and grace and that we may come to know and walk with him. The third point I have is when, when God's, God's call, and the same is true today, God's call to Jacob was accompanied by some amazing promises. And when God brings a person to faith in Christ today, it, it comes with some, some promises of God. Not totally identical to what God gave to Jacob. But think, look at verse 13 to 15. There's kind of an interesting thing happened in the passage. You've got, a, you've got this process. You've got Jacob and his mother looking to steal a blessing and deceiving the father. And we know how that turned out. Then we have in the, in the first part of, the, of, of chapter 28, it's kind of interesting if you watch the turn of events, uh, the father actually gives the blessing freely. He says he blessed his son on the way out the door and he says, I want God to do all these things for you. And then he basically reiterates the promise that God had given to him and to his father Abraham. He says, I, 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 he's, and he's praying basically, I want God to give you this. But then what is it that happens? It's actually God himself appears to him by means of this, this dream and this vision. And God himself gives the promise. 
So you, first you got a guy trying to steal it, then you got a father praying that God would give it, and then you actually have God giving the blessing directly to him. And it's not because he's, not because he's w- worthy of it, it's because of the grace of God. And so here's some of the promises. God says, uh, I am the Lord, so he's revealing his personal name, that capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh. I'm the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I'm going to give you, the, in you and your descendants, the land. So the repetition of the promise that God gave to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, land, seed, and blessing, and you'll be a blessing to all people on the world, in the world. But, and so God says, I'm going to give you the land where you are. And then he says, uh, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and so there will be many peoples, and you will spread out uh, to the north, south, and east, and west. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And so ultimately that's fulfilled in the person of Christ who comes as the line of David, as for his human nature, and who uh, then dies on the cross so that we can have peace with God and be reconciled to him. Uh, that God also says, I will am with you, that great promise, the presence, God with you. And, and we think about the promise that's given to us when we become a follower of Christ. Jesus said, I'm with you to the very end of the age. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And then I will watch over you. Uh, God's protection. And not only was God a shield and a fortress to Jacob, the same is true in our lives. God is our defender, our shield, our protector. Doesn't mean that bad things don't happen to Christians and followers of God. Of course those things do. But God, nothing happens uh, in, in this world that God is not sovereign over. He's never the author of evil. Other people do what's evil. But God is our, our defender and our shield and we are to look to him. Our, we lift our eyes up to him uh, for help and strength in our time of need. And then when others go through a difficult time, then, then we say, God, I want you to, I'm willing to be used by you to help them in their time of need so that we can be a blessing for the furtherance of God's kingdom. And then I will not leave you until all this. So God says, so these are the promises. This land, many descendants, all people being blessed. I'm with you. I'll watch over you. And then we think about um, God's promises to us. Uh, when the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, heaven is our home, Christ is our advocate, the help and protection of God, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the meeting of our needs, strength to overcome temptation. These are the promises that God gives to us when, when we come into relationship with him through faith in Christ. The fourth point I have about God's call is that it bore fruit. You know, one of the marks of a genuine uh, follower of God is fruit in their life, isn't it? It's one thing to say I'm a Christian, uh, and yet that has to be matched up by a life that that corresponds to it. Not just words, but a a life that then is lived out that that whereby we bear fruit as to the indwelling work of Christ in our life. Jacob, what does he do? It's kind of interesting what he does. He's afraid, um, for one. You and I would be afraid if we had that, that experience with God. He's filled with awe. He's filled with wonder. He's filled with praise. Uh, he's also moved to action and commitment. And one of the first things it does, it says, is he set up the stone. I don't know about you, but when I go to the Ikea or Walmart, I don't look for stones for pillows. I've never seen that in a pile. If you, when you go to Walmart, you're like, I'm looking for your stony pillow. <laughs> Here, it's great support. <laughs> but that's what, that's, he was used to that, living in the open country. Uh, laid his head down on a stone and so the very next day he takes that stone and he pour, you know he obviously had a little bit of oil with him he wasn't there with servants or anything like that or people attending him it's just him by himself with whatever he could grab on the way out the door but he takes a, takes some oil and he, and he makes it into a pillar and he anoints it and calls this place Bethel meaning the house of God and now there's some mixed up theology of his because, you know, he thinks that this is a special portal on earth between God and heaven. Uh, God can appear anywhere, anytime he wants, in any place. He's not limited to any geographic area. But he thinks it's this, he, 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 he identifies this as, this is where I've had an experience with God, and I'm putting up this memorial stone as a sign of my commitment to him and as an act of worship on my part. Now it's kind of interesting, just as a side note, this whole I, this, what he did what has actually been copied by other religions. Uh, I, there's, if you go back in history, even in, in, uh, in the, the UK, before it was the UK, back in the Rome period, people would take a stone, they would anoint it, and, and it would be, become the seat of the throne of the king. And, so, and their prayer was that they would make divine decisions on God's behalf. 
Uh, and so this whole idea of, of this anointing of, stone, of polished stone. So kings sat on seats of polished stone. And basically was, the idea was that you were somehow inviting God to reside there so that you could, you could render true judgment. That concept comes from Jacob anointing a stone and saying, this is the house of God. Now, it's, it's obviously, it just shows you how people take stuff and run with it. Uh, but it's a little FYI. More on Jacob's transformation. Uh, now, some quibble with his phraseology. If you look in the latter part, he makes this vow in verse 20. And, some, some, and it, it, makes you, it may make you scratch your head a little bit because you're like, well, what's with the word if? You know, God appears to him in this dramatic fashion. And, and uh, obviously, it, it's revolution. This is the call of Jacob. This is his, in Christian speak, this is his conversion. Uh, and, and, but some people quibble. They say, well, why does he say, if God will be with me and if God will do this um, and all that? I, I would say, don't, don't be too hard on that language. The word since could actually be inserted into the text. If you go back into the Hebrew, it doesn't, there's, the, the word if does not appear. And so it's an interpretation thing where, and people, but people bounce back and forth. Why is there this sort of conditional language? And it just shows you he's in process. He just had this incredible uh, interaction with God. You see that his life is now different. And yes, it's not totally perfect in the way he's doing everything, and it's not perfect what he does in the next few years either. But this has been a radical change in his life whereby God is, in his mercy, has reached down and taken hold of him and changed and turned his life completely around. And this is Jacob responding in faith to God. Faith and commitment, making this vow of commitment to the Lord. And, and you see how far it's gonna go. Not only is he offering worship, but for those of you that like to think about giving in the church, um, he says, I set up a pillar, this is for God's house, and all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. I always find it interesting that the idea of tithing and giving to the Lord's work predates the law. And if you're looking, when Christ talked about, Jesus never uh, turned back the concept of tithing of our incomes, of, our, of what we receive. Here we have, we had the example of Abraham when he bumped into Melchizedek on the way home from rescuing his, his Lot's uh, family, gave a tenth of all he received. And here's Jacob says, you know what, I'm making this vow to you, Lord, and, it, and the, the increase, the first 10% of everything that comes to me, I now devote to you. And so it ought to make us think about our giving pattern and, and our walk with God. And, well, I shouldn't digress too much, but the fact is, is the average person across the church probably gives about 2.5% of their, of their income to the Lord's work. But if you want to look back as a pattern of giving, look back before the law, because some people, they don't like the idea of law and it being commanded. So just look back at the pattern of people and, and how, when they came to faith in God, how they responded and, and the commitment that they had. So that's just something to think about. Another thing I want you to think about is Jacob's actual dream. Um, you know, I was thinking about, I wasn't sure how to put it in. There's a real neat point I want to just show you in a second about this, but Jacob's dream of, the, of God in heaven and the staircase from heaven. Some of you ever heard, you know, obviously whenever you hear staircase from heaven, <laughs> when you think of the song, don't you? <laughs> stairway to heaven um, you know people borrow all sorts of stuff in, in the in the culture around us they borrow biblical concepts and then they make songs that don't necessarily relate um, and so that's where that song idea you know that concept that's a ripoff of the Bible I don't know if it's paying royalties for it or not um, but the point is is there's this stair stairway from heaven and God's at the top Jacob's at the bottom and these angels are going up and down back and forth uh, one of the neat things, and I, I, I thought, well, I better include it because it keeps popping in the back of my head. You know, the Bible says that God sends angels as ministering servants to serve those who will inherit salvation. It says that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. And so here, God, in, and this goes for today, there are angels that God sends to help and, 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 and serve those who are his followers. And so as he has this vision, one of the takeaways that just pops into my head is, that vision of angels coming, doing God's will between heaven and earth, that carries on today in, in God's work. And, and the proof is found in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. The other thing I want to just make mention of is the next point. Uh, go back. Um, is 
this transforming work that God began to do in Jacob's life that day, that transforming work is, is seen in our own lives. When a person is born again, as Jesus, remember Nicodemus came to Jesus at night? Jesus said, you need to be born again if you want to enter into the kingdom of God. And he didn't get it. Because he's like, well, how am I going to get back inside my mother's womb? That doesn't work. And Jesus is talking about something spiritual happening. He's talking about have being, being made right with God and having your sins forgiven and entering into relationship with God. There needs to be a transformation spiritually that happens in your life. And is God's the one that does that work. And he does it when a person repents of their sins and puts their faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. And so, the, so when a person makes this commitment to the Lord, the Bible says they become a new creature in Christ. They're not the same person that they were before. And so whatever sin that one had, you know, a person sometimes is labeled as a thief or a liar or something because that's how they're, that's the life that they've been living, how they're known. But that's not how you identify Christians. You don't say, well, you know, let's go to the thieving church. <laughs> you know, it, it, why? Because we're new creatures in Christ. Our identity is in Jesus. It's his righteousness applied to us. And, and yes, there's still temptation that you and I face and still sin that we commit. And, and we praise God that we have Jesus who speaks in our defense before the Father, having shed his blood for us. And so this, this work of transformation that God began in Jacob's life and over the next 20 years, he learned the hard way. He bumped into someone that was worse than him. That was his mother's brother. <laughs> we spent 20 years ripping him off. Uh, but Jacob learned through those trials. He became a man of God through the things that then came his way. And his life was totally, radically transformed by God at this place when he met with God. And God lavished on him these promises. This was his experience of coming to God. And when you, when you give your life, life to Christ, God begins a work. He who began a good work in you, it says in Philippians, uh, will carry it on to the day of completion. God will finish the work he starts. Now there's one last thing I want to um, just draw your attention because it's really kind of cool. Is Jesus is the fulfillment of, Jake, of Jacob's vision. Take a look with me. It's kind of fun. At John chapter 1. So you've got Jacob's vision, his dream, and God's call. And then you come up into the New Testament, starting in verse 43, John chapter 1, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, fourth book of the New Testament. And Jesus is just at the beginning of his ministry. It says, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Now Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida, and Philip then went and found Nathanael, and he told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. To which Nathanael said, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Well, come and see, said Philip. Now when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, he says, Here's a true Israelite in whom there's nothing false. Well, how do you know me, Nathanael asked. To which Jesus said, I saw you while you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And then Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You'll see greater things than that. And then he added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Now, Maybe Jesus knew what Nathaniel was meditating on when he was under the tree. In fact, a lot of the commentators that I read of said that here's Jesus. Not only does he, does he uh, identify himself as God by being all-knowing. No one told Jesus where Nathaniel was. Jesus knows in himself because of his divine nature. But, it's, but the, the commentaries that I, that I was reading said, you know what? This could be the very thing that, that Nathaniel was meditating on when he was by himself having his spiritual retreat with God. And why, why, was, why does Jesus mention this particular thing about the angels descending and ascending? But the point is, is here's Jacob. He has this dream. God's at the top. Angels are going back up and down the staircase. There's this gulf between him and God. Uh, and yet, who is it that bridges it? It's Christ. And, and what does Jesus say then in John chapter 14, verse 6? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. 
And so Jesus is the fulfillment of Jacob's vision of God in the ladder. Jesus is the one that bridges the gap. He's the one that is the mediator between God and man. Uh, and not only that, then you read of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is uh, preparing for dying on the cross on our behalf. And it, and it talks about great drops of sweat, like it was like blood flowing out of him that was coming that fast and furious. And what does God send? He sends an angel to minister to Christ. And the same thing happened when Jesus is in the wilderness after the 40 days. God sent his angels to, tend, to minister to Christ and his needs. And so, but ultimately, Jesus is the one who fulfills this. He is the one, the, the mediator between God and man. He is the way to heaven. He might say he's the ladder. And so if you don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, you don't have, put your faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. He is the only one who can save a person from their sins and, and give them eternal life. That's the mission of Christ in coming to earth. To die on the cross. Jesus came on a rescue mission to save us from our sins so that we could have peace with God. And then what does God do? He gives us incredible promises. He never leaves us or forsakes us. Uh, and, and, he's, and not only promises and help for today, but also for tomorrow as you and I look forward to the coming of Christ and the new heaven and the new earth that God is, 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 will, be, will make for us. The Lord bless you. Uh, this time, just, uh, just take a few minutes to, uh, Chris is going to play, and then we're going to celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper together.